This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we make lightning protection easy. If your wind turbines are due for maintenance or repairs, install our Strike Tape Retrofit LPS upgrade at the same time. A Strike Tape installation is the quick, easy solution that provides a dramatic, long lasting boost to the factory lightning protection system. Forward thinking wind site owners install Strike Tape today to increase uptime tomorrow. Learn more in the show notes of today's podcast. Welcome back. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And I'm Rosemary Barnes. And this is the Uptime Podcast, bringing you the latest in wind energy tech, news, and policy. All right, welcome back to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's episode, we've got a full uh, full docket today. We're going to talk about Vestas closing three plants in Europe, some interesting submersible technology coming out of ORE Catapult. Ridley uh, is hoping to contribute um, a lot of robotics to submersible and undersea development, so we'll see what's going up there. Uh, we'll talk about GE Renewable Energy uh, partnering with VoxelJet, some really interesting sand casting um, and 3D printing stuff uh, going on there. We'll talk about Chevron and some of their uh, shareholder meetings. Their CEO has been talking uh, kind of about their future, and it looks like to be in in, in contrast with what uh, Shell is doing. So we know a lot of the oil companies are moving into renewables, and Chevron has a good view of renewables, but it doesn't sound like they'll be investing in them. Uh, we'll talk about electri- electricity prices uh, climbing rapidly in Europe. Uh, the world's biggest carbon capture machine now flipped on. I'm sure Rosemary's got big things to say about that. Uh, we'll also talk about, at the end, uh, some big recruiting and job stuff, a, a really big topic about interviews, the uh, job description process, algorithms, filtering, and whether or not uh, employees in wind and other sectors are suffering because some of just maybe the digital hiccups that are going on in hiring right now. So before we get going, I want to remind you to sign up for Uptime Tech News. You'll find that in the show notes of this podcast today, whether you're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever. And definitely check out uh, uh, Rosemary's Engineering with Rosie YouTube channel, which you'll also find in this description here today. So, uh, Rosie, let's get started with you. Vestas is closing three plants in Europe. Um, Is this something that people should be really alarmed about? Obviously, some jobs are going to be cut. Um, but what does this look like for Vestas and their future? Well, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say what their, their business looks like, but I think when companies are deciding where to have their factories and keep their factories, it's mostly to do with one where their you know, sales pipeline looks like it's going to be and two government incentives for, for them to be there. I know usually when you see a new factory announced, it's not just purely off the strength of the business case. There's, there's usually some sort of incentive from the local government, uh, either forcing them to be there through having local content requirements, or are they you know, giving them the land for free or some tax break or something. So I guess it's a combination of those things, but um, if they're closing factories, seems like we're probably, they're expecting to sell less uh, less turbines in those areas at least. So that from that point of view, I guess that's a shame. Yeah, so it looks like some of the a lot of the blades manufactured in these facilities. There's one in Germany, one in Spain, one in Denmark that they're closing. Um, it looks like they're manufacturing just a limited number of blades for V117 and V136 turbines, which are on the smaller end of their platforms. So it sounds like the de- the demand for those platforms are just decreasing. Alan, is that the the way you kind of see this? Yeah, and the demand in the United States has been decreasing uh, for those particular types of turbines for a while. So you know we're all pushing five, six, seven, 12 megawatts, as we talked about the Halliade. Uh, and with the offshore effort going on, there's gonna be massive amounts of money needed to, to build factories and uh, next to the shore and to get involved in offshore because that's where the next 10, 20 years of revenue is gonna come from. So if you have older facilities on, on land somewhere, it just makes them really unusable because of the size of the blades are gonna get so big that doesn't not be able to move them around. So you, you got to get to the coastline. You got to close those factories. Hopefully, move some of the people because I'm sure they're very competent people. But move them to the new factories you're going to create off just on the on the shoreline next to those new offshore facilities. 
Yeah, I mean, it sounds like they're going to re- relocate a lot of them. So this uh, article from Renew.biz, um, yeah, it says they're going to try to place people wherever they can. And it seems like it might be a little more of a reorganization than just purely, you know, like a, like like the way you might shutter a factory in you know, like the auto industry or something where it just seems like, hey, we're not doing this anymore. It seems like they're just doing things a little bit differently. And a lot of these employees will, you know, unfortunately have to be relocated. But it sounds like a lot of them might keep their jobs or just start to find a new niche within within the company. Um, so moving on, uh, ORE Catapult is, it's got some, they're always doing cool stuff, right? And one of the companies that they're, uh, helping is Ridley, a submersible platform that's going to help transport large ro- robots and remote operated vehicles, um, to offshore sites. And then it sounds like there's a, I don't know, a pretty interesting platform here where these submersibles are going to sort of. I don't know. It sounds like there's just a lot still here in development. Alan, what did you take from this technology that they're announcing? So what it is, it's like a s- small submarine. That's essentially what it is. With it's a- autonomous or remotely piloted, and then inside of the submarine, they have the sort of the smaller uh, drone submersibles that you would see when you watch an adventure show or watch somebody out. A- uh, Jacques Cousteau kind of thing where they throw this drone over the side of the boat and it goes down to the bottom of the sea and that finds an old shipwreck or something like that. So what they've done is they've made a, a submarine with a door on it and then inside of that are these little submersible drones and the drones are connected to the the little submarine. So the, the, the benefit of this is that you just don't have any people involved. And so the, the most expensive part of any sort of off sh- offshore adventure is the people because you got to feed them, you got to house them, you got to provide medical care, the whole thing, right? So it gets really expensive. So if you can cut all the people out and make it autonomous, then it dr- drives down the cost and then it, it explodes the possibilities. And possibilities. But did you notice that they're also talking about uh, seafloor mining at the same time as one of the opportunities they have is that so much of the seafloor has been unsearched that, well, now you could search it. You know, you could find old treasure down there, right? Old pirate treasure at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so it's it's a pretty cool technology. Yeah, and this so, and so the the parent company, so Ridley is the platform. Uh, Hanu works with H uh, O N U W O R X at the end. Um, yeah, it sounds like they've they've got their eye on a lot of different potential solutions and things they can do at the bottom of the ocean. The under the subsea mining seems really complicated. There's another uh, I'm not going to be able to recall the name at, at this moment, but there's another company that was involved in a SPAC going IPO or you know going to their the initial public offering through a SPAC and trying to do subsea mining. And once the SPAC merger completed a lot of the shareholders pulled out and didn't, you know, eventually give their money to the company. So they ended up having a tiny fraction of what they were hoping to, to raise. And uh, basically they were saying they needed billions and billions of dollars to do this subsea mining uh, the way they intended. And it was going to be quite a long road to profitability. So I'll be curious if they have a different sort of vision, because I think this vision was something like 13 billion in over five years before they were going to start being profitable. And again, don't quote me on that because this is an article kind of unrelated to here and and, and you know our conversation always goes different ways where here it is relevant again i didn't have all the details ready but yeah subsea mining i mean rosie where are your thoughts i know you've talked a lot about lithium mining and some of the other mining um related topics in in energy is subsea mining something that we can really expect in the near future i actually literally did not even think about subsea mining as a thing until you mentioned it just then my initial reaction it seems is really like, hard oh, it really yeah, hard. and also like, oh, isn't there like you know one place on the planet that we can just leave the way it is? And I guess, yeah, I guess of course, of course not. Where <laughs> human nature is what it is. I mean, um, it's cool if they're going around hoovering up pirate booty that's been lost. You know, that <laughs> that's cool. Um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I did do a video recently on on lithium mining, and one of the points in it, you know, because people wonder, oh, are we going to run out of lithium? And my guest Alex Grant, he mentioned that you know, even if you just look at the amount of lithium in the oceans, there's still you know millions of times what we're expected to ever need annually. Um, but I know a lot of people interpret that to say, like you know, as oh, okay, soon we're going to be getting out lithium from the ocean, and I don't, I don't think that it's going to be soon. I think you know, maybe in a thousand years, um, if we're still here on the planet, then you know, we might be at the point where we need to do that. So yeah, maybe maybe that's the same for um, 
ocean mining in general, but I guess it just depends what's what's there and how valuable it is. I mean, I know when I talk to people working in the space industry, they say asteroid mining is is definitely going to be a, a thing in the you know in the next few decades. Next few decades. So, I guess the reality is, if there's something valuable and we can access it in an economic way, then what, then someone's going to. So yeah, I, now that I'm aware of the possibility of ocean floor mining, I'm sure it will happen in you know the next ten years. <laughs> Well, it just sounds really complicated, and this is not the biggest, so we're not going to get off topic too much, but that just seems like a really, I mean, Alan, you talk about hard engineering challenges to solve. Number one, you can't breathe underwater, so everything's <laughs> got to be in a bubble or in a sea lab or in autonomous. a submarine, or it's all got to be autonomous. I mean, that seems like, I mean, obviously we've been drilling for oil in offshore uh, platforms for a long time, but... Anyway, not a mining expert, but some pretty cool technology coming out of ORE Catapult. Uh, not surprising there. So moving on to GE and VoxelJet. Alan, we're going to need you to go ahead and explain the, some of this 3D printing stuff uh, as it pertains to sand. Because this technology is not as cut and dry. Like they're talking about 3D printing and, and their binder jetting technology. What is VoxelJet's binder jetting technology and how would this help? Uh, GE. So they're making a casting mold and or sand sand mold to pour metal into to make a casting of a, a particular shape they need for a wind turbine part. And a lot of times, uh, some of your some of the cheapest ways to do that is to make a sand mold because the sand's reusable and you just pour the hot molten steel into the shape and the steel fills it up and when it cools you just break it apart and reuse the sand and and do it again and you have a you have a usable part the problem with sand cast sand casting is it's kind of crude on the final shape at times so depending on how that sand set up and and uh, just some of the details about it, your 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 casting can have really clean features or can be kind of muddled. And the problem with a, a casting that's kind of muddled is you, you end up doing a bunch of machining on it and it just takes more time. So if you can get a really clean part out of a cast of a casting, that's just a huge cost saver overall. So three D printing uh, a, a mold. Makes a lot of sense. You know, we, we've talked about different ways of making tooling and that sort of thing with 3D printing. The, the idea of using sand has never popped up, but now that it, now that they brought it up, it just makes total sense. Why else? We wouldn't do it any other way. That's just the most efficient way to do it. So, you know, GE's been really fishing around. If you've noticed GE the last couple of years, they've been picking technology like the recycling of the blades and uh, some of like the two-piece blades and the concrete towers with Cobod. So they're picking technology up as they see it and making it part of their more of their integral business, basically taking players, technology players out of the marketplace, which is a really inter interesting play because it's going to change the way that the competition has to respond to that. Right. Uh, so the technology is cool, but I, I think on the broader perspective, this is more of a sort of a business play for GE. Well, it says some of these parts, um, these metal parts that can be used for haliadex nacelles can weigh up to over 60 metric tons um, and take 10 weeks to mold and produce. And this could cut them down to maybe just two weeks time. Um, in addition, they make a claim that it can reduce the carbon footprint. Um, Rosemary, what do you think about 3D printing in, in regards to that claim with reducing carbon footprint? Oh, well, yeah, I don't know if that's the first benefit that jumps out at me. To me, it sounds like the exciting thing is the, the reduction in the lead time and ability to make changes because, you know, um, if you're making molds in the old traditional way, that was a really expensive piece of kit and you don't make it until you have you know frozen your design and and then you don't make a change unless you, you absolutely have to you know like it just just simply doesn't work <laughs> um so i think that's the coolest part is that it adds some flexibility and we see the same thing with um you know they're changing the way they make blades um molds for the wind turbine blades as well and the 3d printing a lot of the actual metal components as well all of that uh, i mean there's benefits in terms of the the, simpl the simplicity and the, the cost of the parts and usually if you know you're saving in materials and you're saving um, emissions and energy and um, energy use as well so it, it's all related but to me as a development engineer the most exciting thing is the flexibility and the design process to be able to 
order later and change um, change your design if you you know have a good reason to. So I think that's cool. Yeah, and it seems like the the push to three D printing is also going to make it a lot more. I don't know if modular is the word, but just easily transportable, relocatable. They can do this closer to the offshore ports or at the port or out even on a boat potentially. Not that they would mold and cast you know metal parts on a boat. I'm sure they wouldn't, but you never know if we get to that point where you just sort of have a <laughs> offshore little community, you know, in the center of a, a wind farm where it's like, Hey, this, we're just going to do a lot of stuff out here and cast parts and do all that. And then just, you know, dismantle it when the wind farm is done. You never know where things could go. I mean, if you're, if you can set up shop, you know, at the port on the shore, why couldn't you maybe set up a temporary shop for a year, you know, offshore closer to all the turbines? Well, you never know. Right. So, um, Alan, does this look like that's kind of like the way things are going and this might just be <laughs> one piece to keep exploring and making things just easier to get offshore uh, farms done? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I've been watching is the number of offshore rigs that are, are in development to to construct wind turbines with. And those offshore ships are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger because they're trying to do so much out on the ocean, which is, again, it's cheaper to do it that way. I mean, you're, you're as an employee, you're out on this <laughs> moored ship out in the middle of the ocean, but those ships are enormous. They're just enormous. So you can start thinking about maybe we can pour metal. Maybe we can lay up composites. Maybe we can uh, do some of the machining and, and whatnot right, right there on site because it, it changes the whole way you do and think about creating a wind turbine today even onshore we don't have that capability really we're just, we're playing around with it now just now but if we're going to make 10 megawatt plus generators out in the you know offshore a couple kilometers it may make sense to, to actually put a, a factory in the ocean it, it would kind of make sense rosemary is this is this, is this in our future Give us a prediction. It what do you think? It sounds like Waterworld. Do you remember that that movie? Um, I remember oh, at the time it was the most yeah. expensive one ever made, and it was a huge flop. I was a teenager, a and I saw it, and I, terrible, I thought it was cool. Terrible movie. Um, but yeah, you know, like with the way that sea level rise is, is going, then maybe that is our our future. But I certainly, if it was up to me, I wouldn't choose it. I, I mean, casting something on you know a moving platform seems. Very difficult, um, and in general, you know, anything that happens offshore is much more expensive than the same thing happening onshore. So, I mean, you're probably right that it, it will eventually happen, but I, um, I don't, I don't know how. I think it'll be a last resort rather than. I, I just can't imagine it saving anyone money in the near in the near term. I mean, small like maintenance, yeah. Definitely, and yeah. also the mm-hmm. further that, yes. that yeah. um, wind wind farms go offshore. You know, at the moment, they're all pretty close to shore. But if that changes a, a, a lot, then yeah, I can imagine you set up a, a platform and have you know, like in offshore oil and gas, you have some people kind <laughs> of living out there um, in in shifts or anyway. Um, and I, I bet that they'll have some three D printers and be um, yeah doing their their maintenance from from there. That's that's probably. The next thing to happen and then yeah water world in 50 years or, or whatever <laughs> <laughs> well yeah and at the very least like you said having the smaller maintenance things maybe like they have their couple of drones that always live there so anytime they need to inspect stuff hey just power up the drones or their submersibles you know they have this whole crew of like things they can definitely save money and save time doing that they just live out there so yeah, we'll have our whole robotic fleet living offshore. And that way, if they ever turn, you know, sentient, they're too far offshore to come and take over right. the rest of the planet. Don't teach Although them I'm to sure swim. they'd be smart right. enough to find some way. Yeah, don't teach them to swim. Make sure they rust. <laughs> they rust too much so they can't swim ashore. It's a, per- it's a perfect fail safe. Um, so moving on, Sh- Chevron CEO has been in the news uh, talking about you know, their company's plans for the future. Um, and one, uh, I, I don't know how he said this, maybe, maybe a little tongue in cheek, maybe not, but he basically said, sorry, we're not going to invest in wind or solar. Uh, you know, you can plant trees if you want to contribute to the sort of green energy boom. Um, Alan, why do you think Chevron is less interested in renewables compared to a company like Shell, which is actively partnering with you know, on wind and, and some other projects? Well, I think it really has to be a, a business decision whether they can make a return on their investment. And they have sh- stockholders to report to, and if they can't generate enough revenue for the amount of time and energy and, and cash they would pour into a renewables project, 
then it doesn't make any sense for them to do that. But you know th that's that's where the market's going to differentiate. You're going to there's a lot of risk being played by a lot of companies every single day. Tesla is a good example, and they're, they're just going massively in one direction, and pretty much every other automaker is still playing the gasoline game. So it's a huge risk, right? And Tesla may fail. You know, the cars start bursting in flames, that company's gone, right? And so you're going to find the marketplace try to find a wiggle its way down this pathway. At some point, if renewables become more profitable, let's just say by some miracle we come up with fusion, I could see a Chevron playing in fusion. Totally could. Uh, there's just a lot of a lot of variables here, and it's it's okay with me, right? If Chevron decides to do it, and not get involved, get involved in renewables, and happens to fade away, someone will step in its place. That's that's the way the marketplace is set up. So they made their bed; they're going to have to live in it, right? Well, I'll read a quote from his interview on CNBC. He said, "These are technologies that are relatively mature," um, referring to wind and solar. There's plenty of capital that's available. The returns in wind and solar are actually being bid down, and we've concluded that management and our company can't create value for shareholders by going into wind and solar. So, um, Rosemary, obviously, you know, different companies are going to have different perspectives, and no one can predict the future. And some of this is definitely true that it's getting harder for you know OEMs, for example, to make a profit on their wind turbines. And like like you said, there's in this race to plant as many of these you know wind turbine trees in the ocean forest, right? It's becoming Everyone's trying to bid them down, like you said. So do you think um, there's just going to, is there ever going to be a consensus among oil companies that they're all going to rush in or is it still going to be kind of, hey, we're just not sure yet? Well, I don't see a lot of parallels between um, an oil and gas company and a wind farm or a solar farm developer. So I I don't necessarily disagree. I, I probably am more surprised by the phrasing that, like, you know, go plant trees if you want a clean energy future. Because to me, it just seems like this that isn't the right part of the clean energy transition for them to participate in. But I think most fossil fuel companies um, have recognized that if they want to be sure of having a profitable business in 10, 20, 30 years time, then they are going to have to participate in the clean energy transition. Because, I mean, the, the world is basically committed to going all the way to to zero, right? So I think something like 8% of fossil fuels used are for non-combusting purposes. So, you know, are they just going to wear a 92% <laughs> reduction in their, their business or are they going to find something to move into? And I think that's a big reason why so many fossil fuel companies are excited about hydrogen, um, leaving aside, you know, the um, <laughs> conspiracy kind of perspective, which I don't think is that far fetched that, you, you know, they're just um, trying to use it as a distraction. But assuming that we can get to a truly green um, hydrogen product, hydrogen is so much more similar to the um, you know kinds of business that these companies are used to dealing with. I can see that they would be the right people to make that happen. Whereas with solar and wind, it's I mean, it's energy, but you know, it's it's not at all the same to build a wind farm and operate it as it is to you know um, extract a bunch of fossil fuels out of the ground and move it around and and sell it. They're just two totally different things. So um, yeah, to me that that's that's what makes sense. And then the other phrasing of it is probably just you know to generate headlines and keep a certain portion of their shareholders happy. Yeah, and of course uh, Chevron has some rocky times ahead. The uh, a coalition of green groups has. Uh, filed an FTC complaint against them, and uh, the House Oversight Committee is calling Chevron and some other oil companies to to testify before Congress about how the oil industry has spread misinformation about climate change. So, yeah, we'll see how this tune uh, they've been singing, how that continues to work out for them, because there's going to probably be some very contentious um, questioning at that that Oversight Committee meeting. Um, so moving on, uh, speaking of um, pricing, uh, electricity has really shot up over in Europe. Uh, looks like, you know, the cost per megawatt hour uh, for natural, the natural gas benchmark has cleared 70 euros per megawatt hour, uh, or just a really sharp spike in the last, I don't know, six months or so. Alan, what do you, what do you, how do you explain this uh, rise in electricity prices? It, it sounds like it's a coupling of sort of two things. Uh, one, renewable production is down. The, the, the average wind speed in Europe has been lower this year. And for whatever reason, I think they're still trying to figure out why that is. 
then the, the carbon tax issue uh, where Europe is trying and the European governments are, are, are placing taxes on carbon creation. And so it, it creates a sort of negative marketplace where um, to fill that in, you're going to use natural gas. That's something you can do. So if your renewable renewables production is down, coal plants are offline, you're not typically burning oil in Europe. So what's left is natural gas. And if you're Chevron, you're not an idiot. And you realize that the marketplace is ripe for the picking. So you, you start raising natural gas prices because you can. And it, it ends up being a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy created by um, the, the uh, I, there's certain countries in Europe that are particularly driving this, I think, Germany being one of them, that are, are creating this situation. Will it settle out? I think, Rosemary, is the big question. Is, is this a temporary thing or is this a more long-term issue they're going to have? Rosemary, where do you fall on this issue? Yeah, so I think, I mean, all of those issues are a factor. And I read also that they had a, a particularly cold winter last winter, which led to, you know, reduced reserves of, of gas. Um, and I mean, if you look at the, I've seen on LinkedIn, several people posting graphs of the uh, natural gas price. And, it, you know, it's it's not a small a small rise in price. It's it's going no, through the, very through large. the roof. Yeah. Um, so I think to me, it kind of highlights the fact that um, there's no energy system that just kind of chugs, that just chugs away, um, you know, without any kind of shocks. You've got to plan for unexpected things to happen, whether it's, you know, the, the Texas freeze, whether it's a, a winter with um, or a whole year with low wind speeds, whether it's some political disturbance. I, I wonder if, you know, with um, as we move to more variable renewables, no one ever thought that we could, you know, just set and forget that um, that's the biggest thing that everyone's thinking about or what happens in these extreme situations. And I think that this this issue just highlights the fact that no matter what your energy mix is, you still have to plan for extreme situations and have, you know, security needs to be planned for. It doesn't just happen by accident. And Dan, does this sort of tie into the, the closing of a lot of the nuclear plants in Europe? that that has been a big driver you're taking a lot of essentially steady energy production offline they have a rationale of why they're doing it but if you're taking a a, a very knowing 24 hour a day 365 energy source off the grid you got to replace that with something and renewables hasn't been able to replace that yet and the same same thing that's happening in europe is it, that's happening in the united states also by the way uh, the state of New York is closing down a nuclear facility five or six years early because the now um, ousted governor decided they was going to close it. No other rationale besides political. Same things happen in, in California where they're trying to close a nuclear facility. I can kind of understand the earthquake situation in California a little bit better than the one in New York. But the one in New York powers New York City. So is it is it making – is it a political thing or is it about, you know – providing energy for your citizens it seems like there's there's got to be some sort of middle ground here and europe's some parts of europe are paying the price right now for the political decisions that were made a couple of years ago yeah well you wonder because i like i think part of your point is that if you remove one source now you're more reliant on two right and then you can right have a you have a very skewed picture of supply and demand when you go from three sources or five sources down to just one or two right um, and then one of those could be subject to like you said a loss of reserves and then prices could spike so right. I, I guess I'll throw back a question to either of you which is uh, is there like a, a an ideal like percentage I mean in a perfect world is it 20 percent solar 20 percent wind 20 percent you know, A, B, and C. I mean, it, do you always need to have your bets hedged in that sense so that if the wind goes off, the solar is still cooking? Or can it, can you ever be so, like safely 50-50 solar and wind? I mean, Rosemary, I'm sure you've thought a lot about these different sources. I mean, how how, how sort of, um, how variable do the, the sources of, of energy need to be for us to be sort of like stable on price and, 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 and source um I, I one of the really exciting th things to me anyway about the energy transition is it's so local like it really depends i mean in australia we will have a much easier time relying you know uh we'll get a much bigger proportion of just purely wind and solar because it's 
it's really rare that you see a long period without sun <laughs> across, you know, all of Australia. Yeah. And the same with, with wind, you know, like we might, we might get a week where you don't have a lot of renewables. But in Northern Europe, where they have the winter with no, barely any sun, and then you can get a low wind period, you know, they've got a much bigger challenge. So I think it, in some countries, you know, like Iceland and New Zealand, um, Norway, countries that have naturally a lot of hydro or geothermal, they're the ones who, you know, have had very clean electricity grids way before it was trendy or anything to do with the environment just mm-hmm. because they had this, you know, reliable, cheap source of energy on tap. Um, so where you've got a lot of, of that sort of resource, then, yeah, you can definitely get to 100% renewables without too much trouble. But, um, yeah, and then I think a country like Australia will be, you know, the next kind of category where we can get most of the way there with wind and solar. Um, Probably California would be similar, I would guess. And then, you know, you kind of just move harder and harder. And that's where you start to see people panicking about seasonal storage that, you know, especially in northern Europe, like, what are we going to do in in the winter times? Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, there's a really wide range of answers to your question. Well, do do kangaroos like running on hamster wheels? Because I feel like there's a big untapped resource there. Um, a kangaroo yeah, they can would burn never, off some energy, never debase itself burn off in some that energy. way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, yeah. maybe like a, a, some mm-hmm. sort of trampoline system that harnesses, you know, the return energy. They're they're quite good jumpers, but. I do think kangaroos have a big, big part to play, though, because, um, you know, people are worried about emissions from agriculture and kangaroos are a very low uh, emissions uh, type of uh, animal. So if a lot of people swapped from from beef or pork to kangaroos and that would. Yeah, that would be a good, no, <laughs> a good chunk I don't of the problem. Kangaroos. There are so many kangaroos. You do you do not you do not need to worry about about the kangaroos. There's so many more because we you know cleared forests and put farmland in. We, they get killed anyway because there's just populations boom because of what we've done to the the natural landscape. So yeah, don't don't stress about the kangaroos. They're doing fine. <laughs> okay all right well the kangaroo is okay all right you're, you are a kangaroo expert so I'll, I'll take your word for it but yeah they're like <laughs> everywhere else they're like these magical just cool creature that i've never they seen are. a kangaroo up close they are amazing awesome creatures. appreciate yeah. what you have your jumping friends <laughs> all right all right uh, so moving on uh the world's biggest carbon capture machine is now chugging along rosie tell us about um when we can expect to be at zero uh atmospheric carbon well i don't think we would like to go to zero atmospheric carbon <laughs> to start with you'll get you'll get people um putting putting comments in, on your youtube video if you say that i already get quite a lot about people um wondering what the I- ideal level of uh, co2 is but mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. I do think that negative emissions through something like direct air capture or also, you know, the um, bioenergy equivalent, BEX, the bioenergy with carbon capture, I think that that's definitely going to play a big part. But there's a difference between playing a big part and being a silver bullet. You know, um, I had a, uh, a friend of mine did crunch some numbers on on LinkedIn and if we were to just keep on generating electricity in the way that we do and then sucking it out of the air, we would need very similar amount of energy to power the direct air capture to capture the emissions from the electricity. So, you know, it's kind of like he makes the joke, you know, is this what we meant by the circular economy? Um, So it's so energy intensive, it doesn't scale that well. You need to move 1600 tonnes of air to remove one tonne of carbon dioxide. So this is not going to enable us to keep doing things as we have been doing them. So you need to kind of keep it in perspective, I think, when you're thinking about, oh, this is a cool technology, it's going to remove, um, you know, carbon from the atmosphere, and it it can and will, but it's like the hardest way. While we've still got um, emissions reduction to do, then that is just by far the cheapest, most effective, fastest, just best way to do it. So, yeah, I guess that's my my contribution to, you know, curtail your enthusiasm. It's it's not it's not going to do what the headlines say it's going to do. <laughs> okay. Well, for a little more info uh, for all of you that are listening, um, Climeworks is the startup that owns this plant, and the plant itself is known as Orca. And they're saying that it can draw out emissions equivalent to about almost 900 cars. So, 
not a lot of cars. But again, this is a starting point. You know, like a lot of these technologies, like we talk about wind turbines from 20 years ago, they had a paltry amount of you know power production compared to today. So, um, Alan, is this something that's going to just continue to scale and scale? And this is just the one of the first headline making versions that is going to be you know, in 10 years, we look back and laugh at how small this is and how far we've come. Well, I think you got to start somewhere, right? And, and there's there's needs to get the technology in service so we can understand what its drawbacks are and how much energy it's using and how effective it is and what are the, the maintenance tasks and what the overall cost of the system is. So then we can figure out what the next generation looks like. And, you know, Elon Musk and a group of investors out in California have decided that this is a priority for them, sort of like an X prize. Uh, event where they're, they're, the carbon capture is going to be a big push uh, in terms of future investment, right? So if you put cash out there, and they're, they're talking about hundred, well, millions of dollars for any particular company, that it'll spur technology. That's the way that you grow it, right? If 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 you have a great idea and you can put it to work, and someone's going to pay you to do that. Uh, it's going to come to market faster, which is what this investment group is is talking about. Like, let's figure out what the technologies are and, and figure out which ones work. I think that's a good way to go about it, right? I think the way that we've been go kind of going about it is having meetings in Paris, France, or wherever else these these UN bodies meet and deciding that this is not good or this is good and this is direction to go. That's not the way humans have evolved at all in anything technology. Big, large uh, committees don't make good decisions. So I, I'm willing to let this ride a little bit longer on carbon capture to see where it goes, because there is there are places where there's uh, too much energy being generated, right? And if there's too much energy being generated, if we dump it into carbon capture while we have too much energy, that's not a bad thing. Maybe that's a part of the solution. One thing about um, direct air capture is that it, it can't work without a uh, value for its product, which is you know, CO2. So at the moment we see, um, what's the other one called? There's, oh, now I can't remember, I should have written it down, but you know, there's two different direct air capture, carbon engineering, I think it's called the other one. Um, and their whole business case relies on them selling their CO2, which is mostly going to enhanced oil recovery. So, you know, it releases more emissions into the air. So if there was, you know, a real international um, trading in carbon removal, then they would have a value for their, their product from that. But we don't have that yet. So I think, like, why would you, even if you had excess energy, why would you spend the extra money to suck, um, to buy the equipment to suck the carbon out of the atmosphere? At the moment, there is no no reason for a company to do that. So I think that that is, you know, something that a... A committee <laughs> needs to get together and um, you know set up the the marketplace for this solution to have a, a place. Um, otherwise, I just can't see how how it's gonna like why anyone would do it. So you're saying someone needs to buy the the thing they remove from the air. They need to buy the CO2, or is it is there some other form they can process it into to make it a like you said a, a saleable a sellable commodity? Yeah, that for enhanced oil recovery, for beverages, for, you know, meat industry uses it. But all of these things mean that the carbon dioxide just goes back into the, the atmosphere. Um, so if we want to pay people to, you know, remove it from the atmosphere and store it forever, um, I mean, unless it's all just people that are altruistically doing this um, or they want the good PR or something. I, I do think we're just we're missing a, a step um, for this to work as a, as a political um, and a market thing that needs to happen before we could see people, you know, use innovation to, to solve this problem. So, yeah, I don't know. It's a, I know Alan is normally not so excited about um, carbon taxes or carbon prices, but don't you think that that's needed for this to, like, why, what, how would it ever roll out if it's not via that kind of a mechanism? Well, creating market distortion doesn't ever create uh, economies that make sense, right? The, the economies are based on a, on a false bottom, and those historically have failed eventually. There's many cases of this over time. And I, I think the, the question right now is, 
uh, how much carbon capture do you do you need to sort of stabilize temperatures? What does that mean? And what is the economic consequence of doing it versus not doing it? Those those are tougher questions to answer because you have to look at everything in, in a broader perspective. If I'll, I'll give you a good example because we're talking about money here, right? I think the U.S. government spent about two trillion in Afghanistan, roughly. I think they spent somewhere around that in Iraq and the Middle East. Now, you can agree or disagree whether we needed to be there or not, but there's a lot of cash in some of these countries like the United States and China, for that matter. There's a lot of governmental cash, evidently, that can be expended in, in, in particular efforts. Um, if, the, if America thought this was a serious enough adventure, they'd find a way to do it. I don't think you have to create a false marketplace for it as much as... Um, uh, create a create a system in which uh, money can be made, and and it'll happen. I was gonna say, you'd think that um, a, a country would say, you know, to meet our net zero target, we need to remove this much, so we're going to pay um, pay the company to remove it. Is that that how the the money? I mean, money's got to change hands, right? There's a <laughs> Yeah, right. So, okay. okay. So let's just, uh, Europe has this, uh, created this tax, carbon tax environment. Let's just say some of the United States gets smart and says, hey, France, you're not meeting your goals. America is meeting its goals, right? They are. America has exceeded its goals. So we're going to make this carbon capture system. You pay us. There you go. Right. France would pay America to take carbon out of the air so they could keep with the existing system because it may be cheaper for them to do that. There's a marketplace. But I think you're talking about larger. You're not talking about even companies the size of Tesla. You're talking about countries now uh, going after this. And I, there is, I think, if you let investors alone long enough, they're going to figure out what that marketplace is and exploit it. We just have made it very uneven and treacherous to, to get into that marketplace. And that's slowing down the progress. And there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities in a lot of different marketplaces, but I think in this one, it gets really distorted because you're never sure where it's going at any particular time. And if I'm if I have this great new technology in any renewable, I, I don't know what to do with it. Because if I'm a company like Vestas and Vestas is, is pushing heavily into renewables, right? America tomorrow could stop offshore wind tomorrow, right? And those kind of marketplace fluctuations make it unstable for investors, which is why renewable companies have hard times with investment. It's it's too volatile still. All right. So I'm sure we'll, we'll come back and have, I mean, this issue of carbon capture and, you know, our, our climate is going to be a recurring one on the show. So more to come on this, but I want to move us to our final topic for today, which is uh, you know, what's been called the the great resignation all over the world with uh, employers struggling to m- find employees and so specifically here today, there's been some interesting research from Harvard University uh, and others showing bias in algorithms for hiring candidates, also terrible job descriptions that are inaccurately describing jobs. So essentially many uh, potential employees who would be you know, desirable candidates for a job are getting screened out, filtered out by algorithms or um, just discouraged from applying altogether by poor job descriptions. Um, and of course, the, one of the growing things today is uh, in trying to find you know more equality here in the U.S. A lot of people are challenging: Why does this job need a college degree? What is a college degree? How does it enhance this person's qualification for doing this job or that job? Or is it just this old tape measure, this old you know yardstick with which to just generically measure an employee without really getting down to the specifics of the job? Um, so, Rosemary, I know you have some um, uh, quite a bit to say on this issue. What what do you find so problematic right now about the hiring system and some of these job description issues and algorithm and filtering issues? Yeah, so I think there's a few aspects to it. And I think the first thing to talk about is the reason why we have all this automation and, and hiring. And I think it's got a lot to do with the fact, you know, now that you apply for jobs online, it's very easy to just apply for, you know, 100 jobs where you would have in the past only applied for one or two. And so I know that when you list a job, you do get way more applications than you used to. And so you're trying to find some way to screen them. And then I think uh, the the challenge for candidates is, is twofold. First, that people generally write pretty lazy job descriptions. They're often, you know, describing um, just kind of what the, the 
last person was like or just adding more and more criteria to hope to get better people so you end up with this you know long long lists of things that may or may not be that relevant to the job and then secondly yeah when they're automatically screened you don't have the possibility to say oh okay they don't have you know floor buffing experience but now that i think about it i don't really care about that so it's kind of a combination of um of all those things together, I think. Yeah. And Alan, you've talked about this. I mean, as an engineer, you've said numerous times in uh, across both of our podcasts that you learn the vast majority of your job on the job. Like you learn a lot of the basics and the foundations. Of course, both of you are engineers, so you both know this, but I mean, Alan, it's still the case that employers need to be prepared to train people, right? And to get them to fit into this exact box seems kind of ridiculous. Yeah, and I think there was a place in time in America where that that was happening, where, uh, where there was a, a an apprenticeship type program, and I know a lot of people over in Europe went through that program. If they're older, quote unquote engineers, went through something very similar to that. And I know Australia the same thing, uh, and and as uh, you know, the universities have have gotten paid for by by the by governments has been more of a push on on having college degrees, but. There is a lot to be learned on the job, and I think that's really key to really future growth is what you learn in that previous position and what you can bring to the next job. I think that the 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 problem has been in the job market is trying to and because the job market's more mobile, you know, people used to stay at a job twenty years, twenty five years. My father totally did that. Uh, people his age did that. People my age. Maybe stay at a job six, seven years. I think younger people probably are there two, three years. Yeah, yeah, right. So there's this constant churn now for looking for new employees. And and left up to anybody, it's not going to be as efficient as it probably should be for the growth of the corporation or for the benefit of the corporation or the benefit of the employee. It's just... It's going to be very hard to make that a, an efficient system, I think. I think that we, we need AI to step in and, and help because, you know, you, there's way too many applications for, for jobs now for a human to deal with. But I think that they're behind. Um, the AI tools aren't really doing what we need them to do yet. So, I mean, I don't even know if it really is AI if you've just got a, a checklist of keywords and you're, you're looking, <laughs> looking for them in a CV. Yeah, I mean, that's, 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 mm-hmm. that's, that's yeah. not really AI. But, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, I need somebody that can use ANSYS. Um, I need somebody that um, has experience with, uh, I don't know, whatever software when that's not what you need. You need somebody that has the mental capacity to learn that quickly because, you know, it takes a few days to, <laughs> to change from, you know, one software over to another one and, you know, maybe a few months to get fully up to speed. And it's the same with, um, you know, changing industry. What I found in my own personal job search history, I really wanted to move into, you know, a different part of the the energy transition. But everybody's asking, you know, if you want to work in um, automotive industry, everyone wants you to have 15 years of automotive experience. And I think that that's one of the biggest problems with this, you know, push for the AI is that it really kind of funnels people into very, you know, specific kinds of people that they're going to get for the job. So it's really reducing diversity, not just in the obvious ways where you have, you know, biased AI algorithms that are, you know, learning to rule out women for technical jobs. But you also see this um, lack of diversity from people from different industries coming together. And you just, you need that so much in innovation. You need people that have a really broad, diverse background they you know come from different countries. They've been involved in different industries, different types of engineering, um, different types of university systems. All that helps to get really creative solutions. And I, I worry that you know that's a big problem with this system that you just kind of you, if you know exactly what you're looking for before you get started, then you can't bring any exciting new um, ways of thinking to the mix. Yeah, and that's one of the problems with AI is that if you train, because like you said, AI is not just using a keyword search and just checking all boxes. What you would use AI for is to say, try to teach the AI to learn what is a great candidate to work at software company Y, right? But the problem that they've run into is that in an already male, specifically white male dominated industry, an AI algorithm is going to pick up on that. And it's going to say, oh, it seems like being a white male is is necessary to be a you know a software engineer or you know a technician or an engineer or whatever right and so then they start to 
select for that same trait because AIs aren't doing this with any knowledge of, you know, equity or anything like that. So they're just trying to say, what are the salient traits that I can find from a data set? And then if this seems like what a good candidate is, then they try to look for ones that seem similar to it. And that can be a problematic thing as well. The, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's so much an AI issue as is a, a legal issue for a lot of large corporations. You don't really want to have individual people making uh, decisions on who you're hiring and who you're not, because I, I think in general, it exposes you to crazy lawsuits. Uh, that if there are, uh, uh, you hire three females in a day and no males in a day, just generically speaking, does the, the male think he's been excluded for some particular reason, that there's some selective bias going on? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to remove the selective bias out of the system. The question is, do you have something to replace it with? And I think the answer is no, you don't, because one, I, I think it's a very complicated problem to start with. You're trying to identify key human issues or, or characteristics, but you're not actually measuring them, right? Conscientiousness would be a key indicator for a good employee, I think. Well, how do you measure that on a resume? Well, you don't, right? IQ. Oh, come on, Alan. The, the, 46, the 46 to 92 conscientiousness scale. Well known. <laughs> well known. A lot you of places. You got to do your homework. I, you got to do well, your homework. Well, let's let's look at it in the sports arena for a minute, right? In sports in the sports arena, they used to, and I think they still do, give aptitude sort of aptitude tests. Like, do you work with other people very well? Uh, the San Francisco's 49ers used to do that back in the eighties. Like, they were the first ones to do that. Like, give psychology tests to their future uh, employees, players, uh, and businesses have been excluded from doing that for a long time. They can't give an IQ test. They can't. Uh, there's a lot of things you can't do when you're trying to define an employee. And I, I, I think that is sort of a makes it very hard for an employer to go out and find quality employees, because I, I think at a Fortune 500 company, uh, they are looking for certain demographics. There's no doubt about it. There are certain demographics that they are trying to promote to get into their company. And if you happen to f fit that key characteristic, they want you there. Uh, I, I think the question is, there's, what does everybody else do? Right. Everybody else is still stuck in trying to do the best they can with their sort of their hands tied and trying to find a good employee. And and Rosemary, I don't know what it's like in, in Australia, but I'm curious to hear. Do you have those sort of same limitations on finding employees over there? I mean, it's been a while since I was applying for jobs in Australia, actually, um, or working for another company in Australia. So I'm not 100 percent sure that I'm up to date. But no, that didn't ring a bell to me, actually. Um, and also, I, I've always wondered, yeah, it's technically illegal to ask certain questions, you know, like, um, <clears throat> for example, one time early in my career, I got asked uh, if I was planning to, you know, have babies soon because all the female engineers that they hired um, just went off on maternity leave immediately and you know that's illegal um but what am i what am i going to do about it you know <laughs> like am I, there's no way that they uh, that i could prove that they didn't hire me because of of that um and it uh, also just didn't really seem like a fight i needed to have something that i needed to be covered in the media and have you know follow me around in every other job that i apply for so i never really i don't feel like the, there's the the laws but i think it's so rare that um people are actually, you know, um, using using those laws. But I know that America is a much more um, litigious society than Australia. So maybe people are legitimately scared of that over there. Whereas in Australia, I think we probably have many of the same laws, but no one really pays them much notice. I could be totally wrong. <laughs> well, Dan, I think one of the things in Rosemary, I think one of the issues about finding a new position or a new job, that sort is that I, I don't think we teach those skills very well. I think in the United States, we don't teach them hardly at all. And so your uh, young college graduate, a young high school graduate is sort of left to their own devices to figure out how to go make that happen. And a lot of it is just human interaction, like uh, being presentable, showing up on time, being conscientious, right? Doing, uh, saying hello, those, those kind of simple things. A lot of times will get you a job versus someone who dresses sloppily or just shows up late. And those kind of things uh, drive hiring decisions in, in the wind turbine world as well as any other sort of uh, professional endeavor. And I, I, I think, uh, you know, if, if, if the United States or, and, and 
I'll talk about the United States. I think if they were, um, if we did a better job of presenting people, uh, uh, making people much more uh, grabbable candidate, it'd be easier just to hire random people. It would. But now we got to try to find this this uh, needle in the haystack thing because uh, relatively few people have those skills to be productive in the workplace. And I, I think companies know that. And Amazon knows that, right? Uh, and, and Walmart knows that. And, and so for them, it is like, I'll hire a bunch of people. I'll see who whittles up to the top. And then I'll grab them for a management position. And that's the way we're going to settle it. Uh, a small business can't do that as well. And it just leads to really weird things like this, which is we've created this AI, it's quote unquote, AI system to try to find employees that doesn't work very well, right? Because the other system does not working either. It's, you know, which which is the real root of the of the problem? Is it the, the quality of the candidate and then the, the 13 years of schooling that we missed out on? Or is it this computer program that's trying to sort these people out? Don't know. Yeah. And this article, which we'll link to in the description, it's from Inc.com. And it was, it was really interesting, well written. One of the big, th big things we've talked about is over prescriptive job descriptions. And so then as you're scanning through this as a potential employee, you're like, well, what does it mean to be proficient at Microsoft Excel? Like, I'm pretty good. I can make, make a <laughs> spreadsheet, but I'm not like, you know, you know, Todd, yeah. the wizard down the hall who can like, you know, calculate the, the diameter of the sun via an Excel, Excel spreadsheet. Right. <laughs> so like they, you know, but if you were making that job description and you want them to have Excel skills, you'd probably use the word proficient. Like you'd want them to be proficient, but it's so vague that it doesn't have any meaning, but it has yeah. enough meaning to deter people who are like, oh, I actually don't really know much about Excel. Whereas they could probably learn it in a four hour online course and be good to go. And they'd otherwise be a really good employee. So, you know, stuff like that's really complicated. I've even seen that in the sports world, like baseball has changed so much where there's a oh. heavy focus on analytics and data. You'll see baseball coaching, uh, positions in like minor league baseball that say you have to have uh, Python experience. And Python is a coding <laughs> language. I've seen these and I'm like, yeah. I would be a good fit for your, like, I'm an extremely smart baseball guy. I mean, that's, I think I am, yes. um, but I don't know one droplet of, of Python, but I feel like you'd want me in your organization. Then you could just teach me that stuff rather than like, like how many people in the world know Python and no baseball? Not many, but no, you could teach them that. And that seems like what more of these employers need to do is make these job descriptions a little more simple and less scary and less of a deterrent. And yeah. of course, you know, not get fed into algorithms where then they screen everybody out and then just be like willing to talk to people and see what skills they do have and see how they can think on their feet and then teach them some of the stuff that, you know, there, there should still be a burden on employers to teach your people how to do things. I mean, Rosemary working in a, a blade factory who could possibly come in uh, with like such a, some, so many of those experiences, like laying carbon fiber, like there's a lot of technical jobs that people who are really smart, competent people wouldn't come in with those skills yet if they hadn't already been doing that job. So like you said, it's, it's, it, it seems like there's a lot of things in, in wind and other places that could just be that catch 22, where if you don't already have the skills, you'll never get them because no one wants to train you. Yeah, I think the wind turbine factory is a, a good example where in general, they're, they're not requiring, um, you know, for the um, technicians or the manual labor, they're not actually requiring that experience before most of the job ads that I've seen, they prefer that you have done a manual job before. And that's, you know, kind of the extent of it, because, you know, you open a new factory, um, people aren't relocating to um, get a job as a, a manual laborer in a factory. And if there wasn't a wind turbine factory there before, then no one has that experience. So I think they do a pretty good job of, um, you know, realizing what kind of person <laughs> suits uh, that kind of work and yeah and and just training on the job i guess old school <laughs> yeah so we'll, we'll keep uh following that as well i mean i think everyone's still kind of reeling and figuring out how to keep their companies staffed and growing and changing in this digital world i mean the pandemic has shook everything up so much that i guess it's not surprising that there's a lot of issues now in various parts of hiring and uh, you know, retaining employees. So, well, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Uptime Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to uh, subscribe to Uptime Tech News, which you'll find in the show notes below, as well as Rosemary's channel, uh, Engineering with Rosie, which you'll find again in the show notes. She does a great job there on YouTube. So follow up there for more info from her. 
Um, thanks again for watching. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you are, and leave us a review. If you've been a long time listener of the, of the show, we greatly appreciate a review on iTunes uh, or even just a comment on YouTube. You know, it helps the show grow and we appreciate it. Thanks again for watching or listening, and we will see you here next week. Operating a profitable wind farm is all about mitigating costs, minimizing risks, and being efficient with maintenance, repairs, and upgrades. It's incredibly expensive to send a team of rope access technicians up tower to make even simple repairs. We also know how costly lightning damage can be, requiring inspection, repairs, and downtime for even minor lightning strikes. Maximize the time efficiency of your techs and prevent future lightning damage by installing our Strike Tape LPS upgrade the next time your crews are going up on ropes. Learn more in today's show notes or visit us on the web at weatherguardwind.com.